Well, hello everybody. My name is Sylvain Rochon. I'm uh, getting people to expand their human experience using cutting edge technology as always. Now, this is a new installment for this week. And uh, this week I'd like to talk about computing and Moore's Law and whether or not Moore's Law is still going to apply in the next few years and how it's going. And uh, there's been discussions on the web about this subject for a while. And uh, as always, I keep my eye on computing and all sorts of technologies. And I've always had my impressions or, or, or my brain in a state where there's always something new we discover. It's, it's not like Moore's Law, just to describe it, is since 1965, there's a Mr. Moore, I forget his first name, he, uh, he anticipated a trend of computing. Uh, to be able to, uh, to, to essentially double the amount of transistors or computations per second uh, every X amount of month. He, he said every 12 months at the time, uh, but now it's more like 18 uh, or 24 months approximately. Uh, there is a doubling of, of speed in computing. Now, uh, the way it worked back then for Moore's Law is that we had very big transistors, and transistors is what makes the ones and the zeros. It's either one or a zero, not both. Uh, each transistor is, is very uh, had a certain size. It's either one or zero, and that's machine talk. It's either one or zero, and if you have many transistors, then you're making a lot of ones and zeros, and you can you know do quick internal or external communications from the computer point of view. Now, now the his uh, prediction was about uh, was approximately about how they were able to reduce the transistor size, uh, the uh, how they went from transistors to microchips which contain transistors on them, and how to kind of reformulate things and miniaturize and become smaller and more efficient, uh, so so that you you keep doubling it and you keep um, getting confu computers that are uh, more more powerful for their size. Logan. Right now we have smartphones that are way more powerful than computers that we had, let's say, 10 years ago. And that's because the smaller transistors, smaller size, the technology is kind of involved in there. Uh, but there's a certain size limit for transistors. Because now we're the commercially available transistors are, about, are at about 10 nanometers in size. Now, 10 nanometers is roughly 100 hydrogen atoms Widen. Hydrogen is one of the smaller atoms, so uh, so it would be approximately 33 cesium uh, atoms, which is a, an atom that is fairly big in diameter. Uh, it's not a whole lot of atoms, and recently we know that in uh, about in 2019 we should start seeing in market transistors that are n seven nanometers in size, and uh, researchers from I, be I believe IBM have been able to make using a different technique of, of using x-ray lasers and, and whatnot um, to burn transistors that are 5 nanometers in, in diameter, which is 50 hydrogen atoms. Really, really small. And, uh, and of course, once you get close to the atomic size, you can't really have a lot of moving parts. And also, one atom out of place changes things. And so it's really hard to do quality control if you're down near the atom. Uh, so, so a lot of people have been saying, well, maybe Moore's Law can't, be, uh, can't continue because, I mean, you can't really go beyond, like, a certain size, and we're really close to it uh, as it is. And uh, the thing is that there's, there's been... There have been other advancements that make us believe that, okay, we, maybe we can't count Moore's Law or progress in computing in the number of transistors themselves, but also but, but more in how many computations per second we can do. So we can go beyond advancements in how we are making transistors, but also in what type of transistors are we using and, uh, and computer trans uh, in, in computer. Uh, uh, architecture and uh, other kind of advancement using maybe also different materials, for example. Uh, so and this is what I'm, uh, I've been looking at, and it's been very exciting because quantum computing, based on a friend of mine that knows that space, that knows the developers of quantum computers, uh, we're looking at release of com com uh, quantum computers around 2018 commercialized because we've been using quantum computers for prototype uh, as prototypes for certain businesses and things like that 
And uh, a quantum computer, what's really interesting, is that each one of their transistors actually uh, does more than a traditional transistor. One transistor is one and zero. A, a, uh, a quantum transistor, or, or how we process qu in quantum transistors in quantum computing, is that, is that you each one of those transistors, quote unquote, because they're structured differently in quantum computing, uh, actually are processed differently in such a way that uh, you know they're in multiple states at the same time. So if you had um, you know different bits, like uh, each bit is a one or a zero, and you had uh, let's say two bits, which is either zero 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 one one zero or one one they have four different states uh and you have I for two transistors because either it's a one or a zero for each in a qubit which is a quantum type bit uh, each w all these four are possible simultaneously in the same device in the same little transistor if you will and so far, we've been able to build computers that have either 16 or 17, even th for the rear best one, qubits. That is equal, so we have 16 or 17 small transistors, like quantum transistors, okay? And, and these are the equ equivalent of 65, over 65,500 traditional transistors. So way fewer transistors have multiple simultaneous states, so you can communicate the same amount of information with fewer transistors because you're changing the nature of the transistors, not how small they are. You see what I mean? And these qubits are, uh, I don't know the size because I couldn't find the information, but they're just about the same size or smaller, or you know, approximately the same scale as, uh, as the, the, the traditional transistors. So. So moving from traditional transistors to qubits would improve and allow us to actually uh, work with a different kind of scaling altogether. We do the same amount of computations per second, and as we add qubits in the chain and, and, and pro ability to, to process more qubits at a time, we augment we exponentially the capabilities of the, uh, the microchips uh, without uh, reducing the, their size uh, potentially. So that's really, really awesome and really, really super important. The next thing that I found really important from another article, and again, all these articles and these links are in my blog. So I'm linking my blog below specifically for this uh, this topic, and you can reach yours deeper, is, uh, is an effort from Hewlett Packard where they uh, changed the architecture of the, uh, of the computer in such a way to make it way more efficient in how it communicates internally. Because right now inside a computer, there's a lot of communication uh, through electricity uh, inside the cores and between the different parts of the computer. In particular, in processing, each processor of each core has its own memory. So there's a lot of communication within the core that goes back and forth. And I each core has its own memory that's only accessed by that, spe that specific processor or processing unit. And uh, so what Hewlett Packard, Packard did, they restructured it so, so that because they saw there's a lot of inefficiency in uh, using electricity to communicate with individual sets of memories that are not communicating with each other. So they, they created a structure where the memory is at the center and the processors are all around essentially in modules. And so you have one set of memory that is communally used and processors communicate using optics, so not electricity, which is more uh, energy efficient, uh, and also generates less heat, because heat is also a size issue. You need, f if you generate more heat because you have more transistor, uh, transistors, you need more space for fans and cooling and things like that. So that increases your box and increases the sizes of devices. So using that architecture means, means that you're, uh, it's less hot which means you can have more compact devices using the same size transistors altogether. Uh, and at the same time, from what I've read, it's also more efficient computing uh, in general. So you increases the, you're increasing the efficiency of your computing and you can reduce your whole device in size because you're just using a different architecture altogether. So that's awesome. It's just, uh, so these are all different ways, essentially, uh, to break 
what is needed for Moore's law to happen. So Moore's law is likely going to continue to apply to a certain degree or even better over the next few years, even though we're not reducing the size of transistors a whole lot. Uh, we're just using transistors, different types of transistors and different architectures to get, to get computers to get smaller and smaller and smaller and more efficient and more powerful. Now the last point is actually a very, very interesting and more, I think a somewhat important point for certain applications is some labs have been tinkering with uh, essentially artificial neurons, so transistors that are, that are based on the neurons. Like neurons take on information from all sorts of sources that are usually neurons around them uh, with different levels of, uh, with weighted levels. So it's not ones and zeros. It's uh, it's a gray area between ones and zero most of, most of the time, and they receive these multiple inputs, sometimes from a thousand neurons each, and the neuron kind of, for lack of a better word, calculates <laughs> and weighs these uh, these inputs of different degrees to generate its own impulse and decide whether or not it's going to fire. So there's a threshold, and then after that threshold is reached, uh, the strength of the th the threshold shooting off to communicate to other neurons. And that, uh, that's essentially, you know, I I in a fancy way, like a tr it's a, a biological transistor. Because trans transistors do that, but it's a very discrete. It's either a one and zero, they receive, the e either it's, they receive electricity, it's a one, they don't receive it, it's a zero, that's it, there's no gray area. Like neurons actually measure and reach thresholds and have different weighted values for, for, the, va for the electricity I it is. It also, uh, bio biological uh, neurons also learn. So if, you're, if they receive the same impulses from the same sources all the time, it learns and, and changes its behavior and it, it kind of anticipates it and change its, changes its output dynamically. So the actually hardware, the neurons, learn like uh, from uh, from different impulses what's good and wh and what is needed to reach threshold and give more powerful output so they if they keep re receiving similar impulses or stronger and stronger impulses from the, from the same sources then it 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 actually builds up more powerful responses over time now this artificial neuron artificial or neuron transistor they call it uh has been built not uh, not using biology, but using mechanical uh, and you know no, non-biological uh, components uh, to do exactly that. This is really cool. Not not so much for traditional computing, like you know mathematics and computations per second, that kind of deal, but um, but for systems that we want that we want to learn, like artificial intelligence, something that I talk a lot about here. If we run uh, artificial intelligence software that is supposed to learn, so the software is learning using databases and things like that, that's great. But if the hardware itself also learns what is good behavior, what is usual behavior, what is normal, and things like that by strengthening uh, uh, d different signals dynamically, then you have a winning system that can learn dynamically in multiple ways similar to, wha to what a human or an animal would do uh, and that can be extremely useful for very specific um, dynamics such as running uh, artificial intelligences uh, so I in essence you could have an, an AI that has a certain learning database that has learned many things over 10 years running on a traditional computer and then, uh, and then you have it running on the learning on, on a computer that uses these uh, neuronic uh, neuron transistors. Sorry, uh, the one with the neuron transistors will, will, even though they are exposed with the same stimuli, will start behaving differently because it is not a rigid structure. It actually learns and behaves differently. It's going to reinforce essentially what the AI is learning in, in very interesting ways. So I'm very curious to see how that's going to pan out and in what kind of applications those will eventually uh, be applied to because that's only lab work in that case it's, there's no um, there are no computers as far as I know that are being built for it it's really research on the transistor level to build different things and, and see how they behave but uh, you can anticipate seeing something going on with that in perhaps five to ten years from now maybe 
and uh, and that's very exciting as well. Anyway, that's going to be it for now, guys and gals. I hope this has been uh, very educational, and you're going to be uh, subscribing and perhaps writing uh, me comments and questions, no problem. And uh, I will catch up with you on another topic next week for another installment. Cheers and have a great weekend.